took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood. All right. Well, good evening. Good evening. Hey, this is not our start. Josh, if you can kill that music as well. This won't be our start, but this will be your two-minute warning because we have a couple more people coming in here this evening, and we want to make sure that everybody can get in here. We have some snacks, though, right out here in the Welcome Center, so I'm going to give you guys two more minutes. Uh, go grab a couple of snacks and go grab some coffee, and there are water bottles out there as well. Uh, but we are certainly thrilled to have Dr. Frank Sherwin here with us this evening. And so, okay, I see a big, massive group heading out that way. So I'm going to let you guys take off, and we'll be back here in two minutes. 7.02, we're going to get started, and we'll have a time of prayer, and then we're going to turn it over to Dr. Sherwin, okay?
All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome tonight. Those snacks will remain out there uh, throughout the evening. So on your way out, if you could please do me this favor, please, please make sure that you grab some of those tonight, okay? We don't want to take any of them home with us. They all need to go home with you. We're uh, thrilled that you're all here tonight, and uh, I'm glad that you are. We have some of the teens joining us tonight, as well as some of the college kids, and I think we have some people even upstairs. Uh, you just got people kind of all around ministering as well, um, and so we're, we're just thrilled. We're excited to have Dr. Frank Sherwin with us tonight. Um, he is a speaker for the Institute for Creation uh, Re Research Center, correct, uh, and he's based out of Dallas, Texas. And so I asked him to share a little bit more about himself and as well as his family and really even what brought him up to this area. He's here for a wedding this week. That sounds like fun, right? Some of you parents have been there and you've helped your, ki uh, your kids plan weddings. And so that's what has brought him up here to uh, Michigan this week. And so we're especially excited to have him here and thankful for uh, the call or really the email that we got uh, saying that he was in the area. So thanks so much for being here. Well, hey, before I turn it over to him, let's just have a word of prayer because tonight is really our midweek prayer service, and, uh, and so we're going to do just that. Um, there were uh, the weekly prayer sheets that were out at the doors, so feel free to grab one of those and pray for some uh, that you know have been on there. Um, I'll mention just two updates real quick. Number one, baby Ryan, um, Ryan Porter had surgery this past Monday. He's home now and recovering well, and then the second one that we've been thinking about and praying for has been Heather Turpening, and I was talking to Miss Terry just a minute ago, and, uh, and I think if you follow Heather on Facebook, you can kind of stay a little bit more updated, but she does need some prayer here for some of the continued recovery. Some of the surgery was a little more extensive than what they were hoping, and you could talk to Miss Terry maybe about that, or even just, like I said, follow Heather on Facebook uh, for an update there. Um, but anyway, continue to pray for Heather and Jeff uh, as she recovers at this time. I think I said I was only going to mention two, but I do need to throw out at least a third, and that is for um, Isabella Linguidi, Christina and Isabella Linguidi. Please pray for them as well. I was able to go see them this morning. Um, they're in great spirits. Christina is in great spirits. She's back in the, the PICU with Isabella, um, and so obviously we're praying that she'll be able to uh, leave there here soon. Uh, that's what the plan is, but Isabella um, is 5 pounds, 10 ounces, and she needs to add weight desperately. That's what the doctors are telling Christina, so pray specifically for that, okay? So those are your three updates. Let's have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. Frank over here. Father, thank you so much for today, and Lord, we thank you for our evening together tonight. Lord, we just ask that you'd have your hand a blessing upon everything that's said and that's done, and Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be able to host... Uh, Dr. Sherwin, and Lord, we pray that you would minister to our hearts tonight. God, strengthen our faith because of our time together this evening as he shares. Uh, Lord, I pray that um, we would just have a wonderful time uh, really together in your house. Uh, Father, I pray that uh, if there's one that, Lord, is, is a little bit um, not sure how to share their beliefs about creation, that, Father, tonight would be something that would minister exactly to their need and to their heart. And Father, that we'd walk out of here emboldened by what you have done for us and really by, by the creation story. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you'd strengthen our church. God, we do pray for those that we've mentioned. Lord, we think of Christina and Isabella. Father, that you continue to keep mom and baby in good spirits. Father, I pray that Isabella specifically would be able to add weight. That's what the doctors are, are saying needs to happen. So Lord, we pray that that would take place and that Lord Christina would know that she is prayed for and cared for by her church family. Lord, we think of Heather tonight as well, that, Father, you'd bless the recovery. God, be with even her spirit throughout this. Father, pray that you'd encourage her and wrap your arms around her, and may we as a church family really care on her and her family at this time. And Father, we pray specifically for her physical health and strength now as well, that, Lord, you'd, um, you'd raise her up quickly, and that, Father, you'd grant uh, great healing uh, rapidly. And then, Father, we pray for Ryan Porter as well as he continues to recover. Lord, watch over and care for him. Father, I pray that you'd be with our church. Help us to love you. Help us to grow in you and to be grounded in our faith. We thank you for those that you've gathered here tonight. We pray that it would be a blessing to all of us. Be with uh, Dr. Sherwin as he speaks. And, Lord, I pray that you just bless our time together now. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Okay, thank you very much. 
much, Pastor. Here we go. See, Pastor has a servant's heart, and he knows how to do all that, so that's great. A little bit of an echo there. All right, how's this, Zach? Does that sound good? Two households, both alike in dignity, and fair Verona, where we lay our scene. I love Shakespeare, but uh, so it works out. Okay, good, good. Good to be here this evening and, and uh, to be able to share with you the wonders and mysteries of God's living creation. And uh, I'm a zoologist. Uh, now, what's a zoologist class? Somebody who studies animals, very good. Somebody who studies animals. Okay, so I'm not a zoologist. What's a zoologist? Somebody who studies zoos, okay. And uh, so I'm not a zoologist. I'm a zoologist. I'm an invertebrate zoologist. I study parasites. And I realized very soon that you don't have to go to France to study parasites. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'll be here all evening. Okay. But anyway, it's good to be here. My dear wife, Jan. Jan, if you'd wave at everybody. Uh, Jan and I have been married over 40 years now. And what are we doing in Michigan besides speaking at CBC? Pastor Nate was very kind in allowing us, allowing me to, to speak here. Well, the reason is uh, our young uh, son, not too young anymore, who works at Fiat Chrysler or what, what is it again? Salantis. Yeah, it's Salantis. Yeah, and uh, so he's an engineer, automotive engineer, and he is uh, slowly but surely getting his master's in automotive engineering, going to the U of M, and he's getting married in a week, a little less than a week now, and so we're, we're excited about that. As we say in Texas, we're grinning like a butcher's dog. That's <laughs> what we say in Texas. And so uh, Roy is the youngest uh, out of four, and uh, Roy has three older sisters. Please pray for Roy. But anyway, and so uh, one sister uh, just got married in San Diego, and, and uh, she is uh, going to be here. And then we have another uh, daughter who also lives in San Diego, and she and her husband work for David Jeremiah's Turning Point Ministry. And then the third daughter is a police officer in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, she made Jacksonville PD history by being the first female sharpshooter. So we're very excited about that, and uh, she'll also be here with her, her grandmother, Jan's uh, mom. And so it'll be a good time here in the great state of Michigan, and we're really looking forward to it. Uh, okay, so I was born and raised in Chicago, and uh, then my parents got divorced and uh, moved, my mother moved my siblings and I over to, of all places, England. And so I grew up for three years in junior high in England, right when the Beatles came out. And uh, so that really kind of dates me. I, and uh, so that was there for three years. Went to a, a private co-educational boarding school called Box Hill School. And after about my uh, uh, freshman year in high school, then I came back to the United States to live with my grandparents. And I went to a, a military academy in Wisconsin. So I was an inmate, I was a cadet there for three years. <laughs> Uh, and this uh, military academy, and then I graduated in 19, <coughs> and uh, then uh, spent a disastrous year in college in Nebraska, I put on two kinds of probation. I was not a, a Christian pastor, and I was put on academic probation, I was put on social probation. At the end of the year, they kicked me out, and I deserved it, okay, and I was not a believer. And so I didn't want to go to Vietnam. This is when Vietnam was uh, really going great guns, no pun intended, but um, anyway, I uh, flunked out, and so I was, dra I was drafted. My uncle wrote me and said, come live with me for a while. It was my Uncle Sam. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so anyway, I wanted, uh, didn't want to go to Vietnam, and so I joined the Navy instead and went straight to Vietnam on board an aircraft carrier. The aircraft carrier I was on, USS Constellation, and I worked up on the flight deck. I was in a, an attack squadron. We had A-7 aircraft, and uh, worked up on the flight deck, very dangerous, and I started thinking about the hereafter, and I knew I was not measuring up to God's standards. Well, right about that time, have you ever heard, just a show of hands, of the Navigator Ministry out of Colorado Springs and NAVS? Okay, the Navigators were active on board the carrier, and so they, they got my name 
and my number, as it were. And so without going into any more detail, I got saved. And while the ship was in Subic Bay, Philippine Islands, a Bible Baptist Fellowship and the little ship's chapel that uh, doubled as a janitor's closet when it wasn't <laughs> a chapel. That's how small it was. And uh, so then I started reading creation literature, and that brings us up to speed. So that was back in the mid-1970s, and I heard about this place called the Institute for Creation Research, and never realizing that someday I would be active with, uh, uh, with the Institute for Creation Research. And so we have free publication that's out there in the foyer, Acts and Facts, comes out once every two months, has all sorts of, I think, very interesting articles written from a creation science perspective in the physical sciences and in the life sciences. I'm a life scientist, an invertebrate zoologist, so I write a number of articles uh, any given year regarding uh, invertebrate zoology or any er area, uh, paleontology. And so you can go ahead and read that in Acts and Facts. Also, we have a wonderful devotion booklet called Days of Praise, and this is a daily devotional booklet. It is, a, I call it a miniature Bible study. It is outstanding in some of the, the points that are made by the author, and it, you'd be amazed how much meat you can get out of just a daily devotion there of Acts and Facts, and so this is available. And individuals who are incarcerated in uh, prisons and so forth, they love Acts and Facts. And so you can go ahead and check that out. Also, we have a free booklet called Creatures by Design. Uh, yours truly and a number of other ICR biologists have written articles regarding creation science. And so this is good for somebody who is an agnostic, a skeptic, an atheist, who doesn't really believe that in the beginning God created. Go ahead and give them this book. It's free. If you know somebody and thinks that maybe they might read it, then go ahead and give this to them. And I think they will open their eyes to the case for creation. What did the Apostle Paul say in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20? He said that God's creation is not only seen, but the Apostle Paul used an extra word. He said God's creation is clearly seen. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. God's creation is clearly seen. The Sherwin translation is painfully obvious. Clearly seen. And so, Creatures by Design, I think you'll enjoy that. And so just some of the free literature we have. So if we could maybe dim the lights here, guys. Uh, Zach, if you could dim the lights so that we can see the uh, screen a little bit better, uh, because there are some uh, slides I'd like to show that, that are uh, pretty interesting. And so maybe um, kind of dim the spots or anything, that would be good. We'll look at scientific evidence for creation this evening. And we'll start with, I think, some very sobering statistics. Uh, and this is just what has come up in just the last year, maybe a year and a half. Washington, D.C., Dateline, Americans' membership and house of worship continued to decline last year, dropping below 50% for the first time in Gallup's 80-year trend. Then, two years ago, 47% of Americans said they be uh, that they belonged to a church, synagogue, or a mosque down from 50% in 2018. And look at this, 70% of people in the year 1999 said, yes, I, I attend a house of worship. And now it's less than 50%. So the numbers are dropping, sad to say, and they're dropping precipitously here in the United States. Then, in, uh, way back in March of the year 2022, a poll was taken, and almost three out of every four Americans polled said that they, they do not attend religious services. So we truly are a minority. And again, that's very sad statistics that we can look at uh, and see today here in the United States. Well, one researcher back in 2016, a sociologist, did some research, and his the title of his research is called Why Americans Nuns, and you've heard of the nuns, people who do not submit to any kind of uh, 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 religion or organized religion, left religion behind. And this includes many respondents who mention science. And that's what we're going to talk about here this evening. Mention science as the reason that they don't believe in religious teaching. So they use science as an excuse to say no to any kind of religious teaching. And here are two of the main reasons that they gave when they were interviewed. Well, why is it? Why is it? And here are the two reasons they gave. Number one, well, learning about evolution when I went away to college. And then the second reason they gave was lack of any sort of scientific or specific evidence of a creator. 
Wow, how sad, because the word of God is very, very clear about in the beginning, God created. It really is very, very clear. And of course, the apostle Paul said in Romans 1.20 that God's creation is clearly seen. So these really are tragic uh, statistics. Well, the most fundamental question came up way back in the year 2022. And it said, why does Earth support life while Venus and Mars, and for all we know, any other planet in the universe do not? Why is it we're so unique, they were asking, and Venus and Mars are just sterile uh, planets? It's one of the most fundamental questions in all science. Why are we here? They've been asking that question for as long as man has walked the earth, since the creation, 6,000 years ago. And this was said by Glenn Collison uh, with the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, uh, riding out of Green, Greenbelt, uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, this year. So what's the question they're asking? <laughs> Why are we here? And so I think it's kind of uh, ironic that these uh, students who are being interviewed give reasons why they're not belonging to any kind of organized religion, and they use science as a crutch. Meanwhile, the scientists are saying, why are we here? <laughs> so they're not getting any kinds of answers. And so the evolution of life is clearly not seen. Remember Paul said in Romans 1.20, that God's creation is clearly seen, but when it comes from organic life coming from inorganic non-life, well, the evolution of life from non-life is clearly not seen. Evolution of life is a faith that unknown chemicals came together in an unknown way at an unknown place at an unknown time using an unknown process to produce life. <laughs> what can we say about that? Everything about it is unknown. See how easy science is? Science is so easy, okay? Everything about it is unknown. And ironically, is this why evolution is taught as a fact in taxpayer-paid public schools? That the um, city and county and state and nation are using our hard-earned tax dollars to teach the next generation that they came from a fish. And as I like to say in Texas, we're again it. We're again it, okay? I think you ought to teach some really good science and get away from all that religion that says that we came from lower forms of life over enormous periods of time. So evolution certainly is religion, and, and this is why I think it's important we understand that, especially when so many students, so many of these nuns, as you saw in the slide a few minutes ago, are using science as an excuse as to why they're not following God anymore. Look what it, this um, Mus Musser said. Now, et al. means, and other authors. This is an article last year from Science Magazine. Science Magazine, a very prestigious publication. Do you know how many other people besides this guy, uh, Musser? 18 other people. 18 other people have written this article regarding um, sponges represent our distant animal relatives. <laughs> Folks, that's a religious statement. That is a totally religious statement. Now, I'm an invertebrate zoologist, so I know a little bit about sponges and, and trypanosomes and all these other creatures that don't have a backbone. And I can tell you there is no reason, <laughs> there is no way that you can point to a sponge and say, that's our relative. You can say it if you want to, but it's not scientific. It's, and it's overtly religious statement. It's a free country, you can say it, but don't try and use science to justify or validate it. And so this is what the sponge looks like here. It looks kind of funny. This is not Photoshop. This is just, in, in uh, zoology, we talk about incurrent and excurrent canals. And so this is just some of the canals that are coming out of that sponge. And it kind of gives an animated feature, doesn't it? And by the way, it does kind of remind you of <laughs> something. <laughs> But uh, it really, this is what evolutionists are saying, and 18 evolutionists are saying, yeah, yeah, sponges are our distant relative. Well, that's, that really is religious. I like this statement made by an individual a number of years ago, and look what this individual said. A fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. You know, when I read that, I said, boy, 
boy, I agree with that. And you young people should agree with that too. Look at it, a fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. You know what I say? Spot on. I say hallelujah. I agree with that individual 101%. Let the student in junior high and high school and college and university balance out the, the, the uh, pluses and minuses on both sides of each question. That's what science education is all about. Amen? Absolutely. Well, Frank, who said that? Any guesses as to who said this? Charles Darwin. <laughs> Charles Darwin said that in 1859 when he published his infamous On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. That's a full title of Darwin's book. Ironically, one thing that Darwin never addressed in his book, published in 1859, was the origin of the species. <laughs> he never got around to describing that. But right there in black and white, in the first couple of pages of his book, he made this statement. And I just have to say something. Uh, when we were still in San Diego, ICR, I received a phone call from one of our uh, people who are active in uh, the media of ICR. And she said, if you can get downtown uh, San Diego, get down there as fast as you can. And I said, okay, I'll try. And I jumped in my car, drove to downtown San Diego, found, found a parking space, which was amazing. Uh, I got to this small, tiny address, a small door, and knocked on the door, and a guy came and opened the door and asked me my name. He said, come on in here, quick, quick. And it was really cold, it was air conditioned, this was in the middle of summer. And he showed me a narrow little area there, and he had me sit down on this chair, and I had a pen in my pocket. He took the pen out and put it over to one side, and he put uh, one of these uh, uh, mics on here, and I looked, and he was sitting behind the camera and he goes three two one he pointed at me the red light went on I was talking to Lou Dobbs on CNN and so I was debating an atheist on Lou Dobbs just as fast as that I just I'd made it in just seconds to spare and this lady this atheist was very negative very unpleasant very negative and so I only had, uh, you know, one or two minutes at most. She only had one or two minutes at most. But one of the things I shared with the millions of people watching on CNN was this quote right here. How can you argue <laughs> with what Charles Darwin said? And so I found out later this lady had formerly been a test pilot for a broom factory. <laughs> okay. Anyway, not really. Now, we can have fun this evening, can't we? Yeah, we can. Okay. And so this is especially true when it comes to America's taxpayer-paid public schools. Shouldn't people in public schools, young people, be open to both sides of a story? So when somebody says to you, the student, you came from a fish, then certainly they should hear the negative evidence for that, which is why they didn't come from the fish. You don't have to mention the Bible. You don't have to mention creation or any supernatural uh, statement. You can simply show that the fossil record does not support this strange and bizarre contention that we came from a fish, which is what evolution says. And here are the reasons why. And so this is what I think young people should uh, be taught about, and this is why publications like this are really good to have in your growing creation science library. Well, we must build our worldview on what, class? On the Bible, the Bible written by somebody who was there when? In the beginning, in the beginning. And so we must build our worldview on the Bible, and Genesis is the true origins account. Genesis has been called the book of beginnings, the book of beginnings. Some people think Genesis is just a story, but folks, all 50 chapters are written in what we call the historical narrative Hebrew. All 50 chapters. And so Genesis 1 through 11 should be believed as much as Genesis 12 through 50. And, and uh, even the most profound scientific statement that has ever been made is found in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When you think about it, you talk to a cosmologist, somebody who studies the universe, and she will tell you that we live in a universe composed of three parts or three entities. What are they? Time, space, what's the third one, class? Time, space, and matter. Again, see how easy science is? Science is so easy. We live in a time, space, matter universe. 
Well, why is that so profound, Frank? Well, go back to the book of beginnings, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, that's time. God created the heavens, that's space. And the earth, matter. <laughs> so in the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the book of books, God, who has always existed, spoke into existence the time, space. Matter, universe, the very first verse of the Bible sets the Bible unique and set apart from all the other religious writings. That's all I'm going to say. It's unique from all the other world religions. Other world religions, I don't want to denigrate them or make fun, but simply saying that other world religions begin with what? Fire, wind, water, earth, but not the Bible. The Bible is unique from the very first verse when it has God, who has always existed, speaking into existence, time, space, and matter. Whoa, that is incredible. And so, oh, by the way, time, space, and matter, that's uh, all three in a what? Do we live in a multiverse or a universe? Don't say multiverse. <laughs> we live in a universe, right? What does a prefix uni mean? One, right, so don't pull a wheelie on a unicycle. <laughs> Another time release joke. Okay, so let's see now. We live in a universe, but it's composed of three parts, time, space, and matter. Three in one. Whoa, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Okay, well, one thing that Jan and I taught our four kids as they were growing up is, uh, 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. The word there is apologia, an apologetic, to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. And that's what we should be doing in today's society where anything goes except for evangelical Christianity. <laughs> where you can hear about anything, just don't talk to me about Jesus. What we need to do is put on the full armor of God and be diplomatic and loving and share with them how Jesus is unique. In other words, we should know why we believe what we believe, and that should begin with what? The creation, right? The creation, our worldview that states that in the beginning God created. And a good worldview should explain where we came from, what our purpose in life is, and where we're going when we die. Who should have the most articulate and well thought out worldview? The child of God, the Christian. And here we have it, as the Apostle Peter says in, in 1 Peter chapter three, having an answer, having this apologia, knowing why you believe what you believe, especially when you share with people how unique Jesus Christ is, right? How many world religious leaders rose physically from the dead? Well, Lord Jesus, right? And then there was also, it's a pretty short list, isn't it? <laughs> so what's unique about Christianity? Some people say, oh, Christianity is just another flavor you know, of religion. No, it's unique and set apart, not only because it begins, like no other religious writing as we just saw, but also the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except by me, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ. Pretty exclusive, isn't it? Well, let's say, for example, that a man was on a ship back in the late 1700s, and the ship foundered and broke apart, and he was the only survivor. He was washed up onto shore of this Pacific, South Pacific island. He was the only survivor. And he, he built this little hut here, and he was beachcombing one morning, and he saw the captain's Bible had washed up onto the shore. So he carefully dried out the Bible. And for the next weeks and months, he read that Bible from Genesis to the maps. <laughs> from beginning to end, from Genesis to the last chapter of the book of Revelation. Over and over he read every single word of the Bible as he awaited rescue. My question this evening is, would this individual ever come to the conclusion after closing his, the Bible, after closing it, 
and then looking up and saying, wow, this planet must be 4.6 billion years old. <laughs> no, because nowhere in the Bible does it speak of millions and millions of years. As a matter of fact, it says, it says almost the opposite. When you read the Bible, you find that the Lord it talks about since the world began. Look what it says in Luke, chap Luke chapter 1 and verse 70. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, look at this, which have been since the world began. So in other words, God's prophets and the creation of the world were virtually one at the same time, according to what it says in Luke 1. Well, according to the priest Zacharias, God has been speaking through his prophets ever since when, class? Ever since the world began, not beginning billions of years after it began. In his temple sermon, Peter preached that God had promised someday to restore all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And so for the Christian, I think it's pretty obvious uh, this planet is not many, many millions of years old or 4.6 billion. I remember when I was in high school at that military academy, the earth was only 4 billion years old. Then when I joined ICR, the world was 4.6 billion years old. Kind of gives you an idea how long it's been since I was in high school. <laughs> but the Bible is very clear. There's no reference whatsoever to all these untold millions upon millions of years. The Bible is silent about that. So what is science? A lot of times people say, oh, those creationists don't even define what science is, but they talk a lot about the Bible and science. Well, okay, let's go ahead and talk about what science is this evening. Science is a systematic study, a phenomenon based on experimental investigation, including that which can be, look at this, observed, tested, and repeated. Now, I did my master's research on parasites of a certain kind of a swallow. It's a high altitude um, tree swallow in Colorado. And I had to shoot about 35 of them. And then I had to dissect all 35, and I found parasites in every last one of those birds. They look so beautiful, and they fly so beautifully, but they were all infected with a potpourri of parasites. And so I had to kind of catalog all these parasites and stain them and dehydrate them and put them on slides and all that. And I discovered a new species of parasite, so that was kind of fun. I got it published in the secular journal, peer-reviewed secular journal. So creationists do science, right? Are creationists opposed to science? No, we, we love science. We love science in ICR. We embrace science. As a matter of fact, I like to say that science and the Bible go together beautifully. It goes together like, like butter and bread. Right? Science and the Bible are just intertwined to each other, just like politics and corruption. You can't, <laughs> you can't separate them, okay? And so science and the Bible go together beautifully. But the Bible has nothing to say about the strange idea that says macroevolution, that we came from a fish or anything else. As a matter of fact, just exactly the opposite. And so we are not opposed to this whatsoever. About 70% of what we call empirical science is that which can be observed. And that's what I did in graduate school, a lot of that. And so we're not opposed to science whatsoever. And, as a matter of fact, this two-time Nobel Prize winning scientist said before he died, and he was no creationist, but look what he said. Science is the search for what, class? The search for truth. Hey, that reminds me of a, a verse we just said earlier. Remember that? John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except by me. And so the Lord Jesus, the second part of the triune Godhead who created everything, remember what it says in, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 1? He made the stars also. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He made the stars also. Trillions upon trillions and trillions of stars. He made everything. And so science is a search for truth. Well, if you're truly searching for truth... <laughs> You're thinking God's thoughts after him because the Lord Jesus has created everything. And how, how sad it is today in the 21st century. You talk to scientists and what do they say? Well, man, the truth is subjective. The truth is relative. Hey, man, what's true for you may not be true for me. 
And some are more cynical and say the truth doesn't even exist. And yet we see in John 14, 6 that Lord Jesus Christ is the truth and that He has created everything. So one thing that just makes my heart pound is getting my advanced degree in science and thinking God's thoughts after Him and trying to figure out now what were parasites before God cursed the earth, right? So we have the creation in Genesis chapter 1. We have the corruption of the creation, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, when Satan said to Eve, did God really say that? Satan introducing doubt to Eve. Did God really say that? Creation, Genesis chapter 1, the corruption of the creation, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1, and then the curse. God cursed the earth, didn't He? He cursed the earth with what, class? Weeds, thorns, thistles, I think maybe parasites, my, my field. I think that's when parasites made their appearance. Not that God created parasites, but parasites took on a parasitic existence when God cursed the earth. In the time before that, they were just mellow creatures that just lived in the environment. And even the evolutionists say that parasites have a loss, a net loss of genetic information, which fits the curse so well. And so God cursed the earth with weeds and thorns and thistles, uh, mutations, probably parasites, definitely telemarketers, okay? So creation, corruption, curse, and then God sent a worldwide flood. How do we say that? How about catastrophe? Creation, corruption, curse, catastrophe. But in the New Testament, we read about the Lord Jesus Christ, another C. And what are the C's of the Lord Jesus Christ? The cradle, the cross, and the crown. Isn't that neat how it works out? What's the last book of the Bible? Revelation, Revelation, right? And what's Revelation? The consummation of all things. The consummation of all things. Isn't that neat? So we just did a miniature overview of the Word of God using the seas. Let's move on. Christians need to identify where science leaves off and philosophy begins. That's where we do science. I love working in the lab. That's what I did in graduate school. I dissected all those poor little tree swallows I shot. <laughs> Found out they were all had parasitic infestation. And then philosophy, you know, we talked about Plato and, and all those other guys. For example, look at this, and help me out here, class. So this is quiz time. Is this science? You know, remember what science is? What we can observe? Test and repeat. Observe, test, and repeat. 70% of empirical science is observation. At 13.8 billion years ago, our entire observable universe was the size of a peach and had the temperature of over a trillion degrees. Okay? Now remember, this was when? 13.8 billion years ago, okay? And it was the size of a peach, not a grapefruit, not a grape, not a watermelon, a peach, okay? And it had a temperature of over a trillion degrees. So is this science? Shake your head like this. No, no, that's not observable, testable, repeatable science. What this is, is a hypothesis. It's conjecture. It's an idea that somebody has. It's a one-time event that occurred when? In the unobserved past. It's a one-time event that occurred in the unobserved past. And so what would you ask this guy, Paul Sutter, who said this? He said it in 2018. Paul, how do you know that? <laughs> how do you know it was 13.8 billion years ago and not 13.5 or 14 billion years ago? But again, now, what about creation? The creation in Genesis chapter 1 was a one-time event that occurred when? In the unobserved past. But we have a written record written by someone who was there when? In the beginning. In the beginning. And this, this situation here, they have no observable evidence of that. But with Genesis, we know somebody who was there in the beginning, and he told us what he did. So yes, it's faith versus faith tonight, isn't it? Faith that in the beginning God versus faith in the beginning nothing. <laughs> Remember that nothing? 
underwent a quantum instability and blew up. In Texas, we call it the Large Bang. What do they call it here in Michigan? Big Bang. <laughs> okay. But the Big Bang does not explain the origin of the universe. The Big Bang only explains the expansion of the universe. So when somebody says to you, I believe I came about as a result of the Big Bang, it shows that they don't really understand what secular science is saying. Because the Big Bang only explains the expansion of the universe, and even then, it doesn't do a very good job. And so it's faith versus faith. Now what's the difference? We have a more reasonable faith. We have a more reasonable faith. Because our faith is based on someone who is there in the beginning, and he left us a written record. That's what's so unique about Christianity. That's what's so unique about this, what I call, Pastor, the war of the worldviews. The war of the worldviews between evangelical Christianity and atheistic evolution. And so you might want to learn to ask people who say statements like you see on the screen there, how do you know that? And it just it's an innocent question, but you might want to just kind of hold their feet to the fire there and, and smile and say, well, how do you know that? <laughs> what about the created cosmos, all right? The cosmos, what three parts of the cosmos are there? Time, space, and matter. Time, space, and matter. Well, there are only three options for the origin of this entire universe. One is that it always existed, but that's got problems, all right? Because it's called a heat death, the thermodynamic problem. So I don't know any scientist who really believes the universe has always existed because it would have died a heat death a long time ago. Secondly, it suddenly appeared from nothing. That's an option. And then the third one is it was created supernaturally. So these are the three options regarding the origin of this universe. Well, this is what uh, Alan Guth of MIT said back in the 1980s. <laughs> He said, and I quote, it is then tempting to go one step further and speculate, I like that word there, speculate, and by the way, Guth is an atheist, that the entire universe evolved from literally what? Nothing. So here we go, folks. How would you go about showing that something can come from nothing? <laughs> well, you go to a 21st century uh, laboratory, you put on a white lab coat, you gotta wear a white lab coat, and you go into the lab there and you adjust the bells and whistles so that you'll show that something can come from nothing. What do you do? Open up a cupboard, get a box of nothing. Hey, we're out of nothing. Get another case of nothing. So really there's, no pun intended, there's nothing you can do to show how something can come from nothing. But really that's what evolutionists believe. We believe on the other hand that in the beginning God, that God was there when? in the beginning, okay? But the evolution says I don't believe in God, therefore I must believe everything came from nothing. And my question this evening is, how scientific is that? <laughs> Not very scientific. So God has given us tools for inquiry. I see one or two of you are taking notes here, but these are the two tools that God has given us. And I would suggest this evening, these are two tools that you have used dozens of times today. The first is, you see that three pound brain there? Is logic. God has created our three pound brain. Will we ever come to a final conclusion about the brain where we'll finally figure it out? We never will. You will we will never figure out the brain. The brain is the most sophisticated accumulation of matter in the known universe. And we will never ever figure it out totally. We know a lot of interesting things about it, but we'll never know everything about it. It's just too complex. And the second is observation. We show this guy looking through a microscope there. And have you used logic and observation today? Shake your head like this. Yeah, yeah. So God has given us these tools for inquiry called logic and observation. And logic and observation show the following, that there is horizontal variation. We have varieties of people, don't we? All sorts of varieties of people. And in creation science, we call this horizontal variation. I have no problem with that. We, we see that all the time. We not only with people, but with puppy dogs and cats and everything else. As a matter of fact, when it comes to plants, look at this. There's approximately 13,000 identifiable varieties, and by that I mean cultivated hybrids. Cultivated hybrids of roses throughout the world, and what are they? 
<laughs> they're all roses, okay? 13,000 varieties of roses, and they're all roses. So God has placed into a rose all sorts of genetic variation, and you can get all sorts of varieties there. Well, what about in the animals? Look at this. Well, I'll give you a hint. This is the mama. There's mom there. This is Junior. Junior doesn't quite look like mom, except for, look at those socks. <laughs> okay. And Junior's dad is a donkey. And Junior's mom is a what? A zebra. See how easy science is? Science is so easy. <laughs> so the donkey got together the zebra, and what did they produce? A zonkey. <laughs> Now, this is not Photoshop, okay? This actually happened, and it happens a, a number of times now. And uh, so what do we call this? We call this horizontal variation in animals. We saw horizontal variation with roses, but we see it also with the zonkey there. Guess what? Have evolutionists used this as, a, as an example of evolution? No. Nope, not at all. You know why? They know as well as we as creation scientists that it's still of the horse kind, right? It's a variety, a variation of the horse kind. So all the years I've been with ICR, and I've been with ICR since 96, uh, I've never had evolutionists call us up and say, hey, what are you guys gonna say about the zonkey, huh? <laughs> the zonkey is no problem for creation science. What about this, look at this. You cross a line and a tiger and you get a what? A liger. <laughs> Again, this is not Photoshop. This, this uh, little liger here is not so little, it weighs well over a ton. So when that liger lies around the house, it lies around the house, okay? And uh, they're both, uh, they both died, but the, the ligers are certainly a variation of the cat kind, aren't they? Is this evidence of evolution? Nope, not evidence of evolution whatsoever. It's again, horizontal variation in animals, whether they're cats, cats or horses or roses. So what we don't find is vertical evolution what the evolution is called macro evolution, the big change. We never see that. We do see horizontal variation, but we don't see any vertical evolution. So created after their kind. How many times do we see that? I mentioned it again. The creation is mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. Here's a quick quiz for you, Bible quiz. Ready? How many times do we see the phrase after its kind, after his kind, or after their kind, just in Genesis chapter one. How many times? Answer, 10 times. So 10 times God is telling us in the very first chapter of the book of beginnings that he created after their kind. You know what God is telling us not once, <laughs> but 10 times? He's telling us that he didn't use evolution. He created after their kind, after their kind, 10 times to make it very, most of us are parents here, aren't we? And we tell our children, don't play basketball in the street, right? Now, how many times do we say that? You know, three times, four times, don't play basketball in the street. Why do we say that over and over again? Because we love them, we, we don't want to see them injured, right? And this is what God is doing here. So let's use puppy dogs as an example. Everybody loves dogs, okay? And so whether they're cold dogs, or hot dogs, dogs have always been what class? Dogs have always been dogs, right? Janice and I back in California, we had a canardly dog. Have you seen those canardly dogs? <laughs> Can hardly tell what kind of dog it was. Thank you. But dogs have always been dogs, right? Cold dogs, hot dogs, they've always been dogs. What is the most popular puppy dog in Canada and the United States? and England and Wales and Scotland, what is the most popular of all those dogs that you saw there? Anybody? No? What's that? Labrador Retriever, right? So the Labrador Retriever is the most popular dog in all those countries I just mentioned. And so here we have the Gold Lab, and this is a black lab. What's the last one, class? Chocolate lab, right? Look at the chocolate lab. <clears throat> yeah, the chocolate lab, all right. And so we got the gold lab, the black lab, the chocolate lab. We have some very weird neighbors in our area where we live in. We're pretty sure that they have a meth lab. <laughs> Pastor, I'm trying. I'm trying to keep people awake, okay? So <laughs> look at that puppy dog. And so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look at his friend there, he's laughing just as hard. But uh, 
anyway, so where did domestic dogs come from? That's a good question, right? Where did domestic dogs come from? After all, we're up to here in domestic dogs. I'm not exaggerating. We, this country is lousy with domestic puppy dogs. And uh, we have our, our ginger at home and they're in, uh, in Texas. But where did they come from? We have enough dogs to investigate and to research, right? But evolutionists don't know. Uh, Michael Benton said in 2015, and he's an atheist in England, he said the history of today's dogs is, quote, still contentious. That was in 2015, it's still contentious. 10 years later, or five years later, excuse me, in 2020. <laughs> but where the dog comes from and how old various groups of dogs are is still a bit of a mystery. And so they still don't know where dogs came from. And yet the evolutionists are trying to tell us that we came from a fish. Something doesn't work here. They can't even tell us where dogs came from, and yet they're gonna tell us that we came from a fish, and that fish came from other lower life forms over millions and millions of years. So this is why I like to include this, Pastor, just to kind of show people that if they don't know where dogs came from, don't, don't go telling me I, I came from a fish or some lower life form. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. So is it really possible to talk honestly and fairly about scientific evidence for creation? What do you suppose the answer to that is? Absolutely. According to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1 to verse 20, the answer is clearly yes. Because Paul said in verse 20 of Romans chapter 1 that God's creation is not only seen, but is clearly seen. And so the evidence for creation is, I think, pretty obvious in my field of biology. Now, Pastor, I don't know what time it is because I don't have a clock or anything. And so how are we doing? Five minutes, okay, so I'll make this fast. Now, the average speaking time is about 190 words per minute, but I'm gonna have to clip these last five minutes uh, at right around about 350 with gusts up to 400, okay? <laughs> and as an infamous King, Hen King Henry VIII of England told his six wives, I won't keep you long. <laughs> okay, so four minutes to go, here we go. Psalm 111 verse 12, the works of the Lord are great, sought out among all of them that have pleasure therein. I love this verse. I love it as a creation scientist because design means a what class? A designer, creation means a creator, okay? So this is the E. coli bacterium, E. coli. Right now you've got E. coli in your hands unless you use all that, that uh, 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 alcohol gel and use it five or six times a day, you, you've got E. coli. But this is a ubiquitous bacterium and uh, it's uh, lots and lots of research has been done. Now look at these little projections here. These hair-like projections here are called flagella. And the flagella are designed by the Lord Jesus to twist very, very rapidly and help to push the E. coli through an aqueous or a, a watery environment. Now, you don't have this in your GI tract. They don't, you don't have the flagellated kinds that you see here. There's various subspecies of e, e. coli here. So what I want to do tonight, very, very quickly, help me out here, is we're going to look and see how this flagellum goes right into this wall of the bacterium here. So this, be, this uh, flagellum twists very, very rapidly, but it twists due to an engine, a tiny engine, that is found embedded in the wall of the E. coli. Now, you cannot see E. coli except with a microscope. Remember you used a microscope in high school and college? You have to put up in high magnification. I used to teach medical microbiology at Pensacola Christian College, and my students would have fits trying to see individual bacteria. Most of them couldn't. And so this is where it goes in here, and it's a little motor. So what are we going to do very quickly, and I got three, two minutes now, is how this goes in there, and we're going to blow this up using an electron microscope. That blows things up about one million times. Let's look at it right now. So here's what we just looked at. There's a flagellum. It's going into the wall of the bacterium. As you see here, there's the bacteria, the E. coli, going into the wall. We blow it up, as the arrow shows here. And this is an actual motor designed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you see this white and black picture here? It's kind of grainy, isn't it? Why is that? Because this is an actual picture of the motor. They managed to get an actual picture of this, and that is an amazing, amazing effort on the side of the scientist because they have to blow it up about a million times in order to see it. So this grainy white and black picture is the actual motor itself. Do you see how detailed that is? 
That is an absolutely incredible, incredible picture of the motor. But as they say on the infomercial, but wait, there's more. And there's more here as we look at this axle here, which is obviously designed. This is what my son does just down the road here as he works for uh, Fiat Chrysler as an engineer, automotive engineer. This is what the axle looks like. And this is what the flagellar motor looks like, as I say, is magnified one million times. Now, the evolutionists would say, well, obviously somebody had to design this. But then they'll look at this flagellar motor in the bacterium and say, nope, it wasn't designed. Why? Design means a designer. And so they would rather say that this flagellar motor came about by time and chance and natural processes. But look at that. Both of these have a drive shaft. Both of these have a bushing. They both have a universal joint, a rotor, rings, a clutch. Whoa, wait a minute, a clutch? Are you saying, Frank, that this has a clutch? Yep. National Science Foundation, right here, NSF, National Science Foundation, it is an evolutionary organization. They did some research and found out that this is the flagellar motor here and it actually has a clutch. How much do you have to magnify this up to see it? One million times. So as we begin to study this more and more, we're seeing Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, that God's creation is clearly seen. Did the Apostle Paul know about this flagellar motor? No, no, uh -uh. But he just knew what he could see around him, and he understood that God was the creator. Now, today in the 21st century, we have no excuse. We have all of this technology at our disposal, and we look at something like this, and we just have to say, how great thou art. Amen? So this is the motor system inside this tiny bacterial cell. This is just part of the motor system, and it goes in that tiny bacterium that you can barely see with a light microscope that you used in high school. And so there's the motor system, but wait a minute, there's also the sensory system, and that is also operating at the same time within the same bacterium. So you have the motor system, you have the sensory system, they're all working together. Let's superimpose one on top of the other, and now we can see how complex this is. The sensory system, the motor system, all inside this tiny bacterial cell. But wait a minute, the cell needs energy, right? The energy is, is done by something called glycolysis. Where you take a six carbon sugar, break it down to two energy rich, three carbon molecules that goes through the pyruvate dehydrogenase system, cleaves off one carbon molecule and takes nicotinamine, adenine, dinucleotide phosphate, carves off two hydrogens that are energy rich and carries them to an electron transport system where adenosine diphosphate is phosphorylated into adenosine triphosphate, which is energy currency of the cell. And we're just beginning to get started with the complexity of this. But also what's happening inside of this is that the DNA has to be replicated or duplicated. And so the DNA molecule has to unwind and duplicate itself to make a daughter chromosome, which is circular and it's super coiled. And all of that is going on inside of here as well. This tiny, tiny bacterial cell. And so it gets very complex, and I'll end with this quote from an atheist. Well, he's a former atheist because he's dead now, but um, his name was Francis Crick. He discovered the spiral helix of the DNA molecule, and he died an atheist, unfortunately, and he said, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. Now get this, he's being intellectually honest. He's saying, boy, we have to keep reminding ourselves that this wasn't designed. It evolved, it evolved. And he's looking at his colleagues and it evolved, right? Yeah, yeah, it evolved. It wasn't designed. No, no, it wasn't designed, it evolved. You know why? Because they're fighting against what is so clearly obvious as to what Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter one and verse 20, that God's creation is not only seen, but is clearly seen and so, People like Francis Crick and others today in society are saying, nope, God had nothing to do with it. They have to convince themselves that God was not part of it. And it's getting harder and harder for them to do that because with e each and every discovery that is being made, it clearly shouts design by the master designer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor. All right, would you give Dr. Sherwin a round of applause here this evening? That was fascinating. That was fascinating.
We are so appreciative of both of these guys being here. I didn't mention this to you earlier, um, but they just finished their drive before they came up here to Flint area. Just finished their drive up here from Dallas, Texas. Um, and so that was about a 20 hour drive and then they came right up here to be with us. So if you're appreciative of them, I want to make sure that you guys get around them and say thank you for being here tonight and for their ministry and what they're doing, serving the Lord in creation science. How amazing is that? Hey, well, we're so glad that you were here tonight. Um, thank you so much for being here. If you have kids back at the nursery, please grab them. Um, before long at least. And then also right outside these double doors, we do still have some uh, drinks, snacks, and coffee all for you as well. Please make sure you stop by and grab some of that. That would be great. Thanks so much for being here. Did you guys learn something? Anybody learn something? I got really lost when he started explaining some of the, uh, that information there. Okay, I got lost, honestly, when he got started, pretty much. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I'm just kidding, but it was really a lot of fun. It was great. Make sure you say thank you to them, and then uh, that would be good. Y'all have a wonderful night. Thanks so much for being here tonight.